And hello everyone, again we're back with the Legends When the Legends Die by Hal Borland. Get a little bit zoomed in there, there we go. We're approaching the end of the novel. We've got a bunch of chapters we're reading today. We're reading chapters 33 through 37 as we're reaching the end of the novel and things begin to happen quickly. Now we left off before where Tom is writing on his own, Red is dead, and uh, Tom is learning to live on his own. And even though he is living on his own, there's still a lot of things that drive him, his demons inside him. The only time he feels alive is when he's riding a horse, because that's the only time he feels in control. At no other time is he in control except when he's riding horses. That way he can dominate the horse, ride it to a standstill. If he needs to, he'll ride it to death. That is how determined and how angry he is at his past, at everyone that's taken advantage of him, everyone that has uh, used him. So now we move up to page or chapter 33, page 140. As we continue, it was mid-afternoon when he came, oh just left off. We just left off. He got injured. A horse ran into a uh, one of the uh, chutes while he was riding it. Broke his arm. The horse died, and so now he's had to take some time off by force. It was not intended, but that was, that's where we left off on page one forty, chapter thirty-three. It was mid-afternoon when he came to the bluff and looked down at the cabin. In that first look, he had the uh, not the uneasy feeling that something was wrong. He drove on down the slope, parked the car, and went to the cabin. He pushed open the door and saw that no one was there. He went out to the garden, found the beans and chilies choked by knee-high weeds, and returned to the cabin. The male's bunk was made, the cooking pots were empty and clean, the, the uh, dishes washed and in their places, and it's 9 o'clock, you can't tell. Uh, whatever happened, Mayo had left the cabin in order. He went out to the barn, it was empty, and Mayo's saddle was missing. Tom got in his car again, drove to Aztec, went to Dr. Wilson's house, banged on the door, and walked into the empty waiting room. The doctor came in out of his office and exclaimed, Tom Black, and reached out to shake hands, and then saw the splintered arm. What happened to you? Just a broken bone or two. Where's Mayo? Have you seen him? That's what I came about. Come on into the office. They went and sat down. The doctor said, Mayo is dead. When? Tom asked. What happened? About a month ago. He rode into town one afternoon, came to the office, and sat out there in the waiting room for an hour, I guess, before I saw him. I brought him in here and asked him what was wrong, and he said, I am going to die. He didn't look sick to me, but I took his pulse and blood pressure. They were normal. I couldn't find anything wrong. Well, how was his mind? Clear as a bell, I told him to go home and forget it. They live another 20 years. But he just shook his head and said, no, tonight, like that, just as if he knew all about it. And he gave me a roll of bills and said I should see to it that he was buried right with the coffin and a priest. Then I asked him if he had seen the priest, and he said no. So I took him over to the rectory, and Father Gomez said he would take care of him. He sent the boy back to get the old man's horse, and I figured Father Gomez would listen to him, put him up for the night, and the next morning he would stop in, pick up his money, and go on home satisfied. The doctor paused for a moment, and then he went on. The next morning, while I was eating breakfast, a boy came in and said Father Gomez wanted me to come right away. So I went. Mayo was dead. Father Gomez had put him up for the night, and he died quietly in his sleep. He looked at Tom, frowning and baffled. That's the story. I wish now I had done an autopsy, but I swear there wasn't anything wrong with him. His heart was as good as mine. He knew, Tom said. What do you mean he knew? Tom shrugged. I've known some of these old people who to wish themselves to death, but that was when they were dying anyway. He wasn't sick. I'm telling you, he wasn't sick. Tom made no comment. Dr. Wilson shifted uneasily in his chair. Anyway, I gave the money to Dr. Father Gomez, and he arranged the funeral. He did it upright. So, he concluded, that's what happened. Now, let's have a look at that arm of yours. He examined the arm, and it was knitting nicely, and readjusted the splints and bandages. He probed Tom's chest with his fingers, listened to it, and said as he put away his stethoscope, young bones knit fast. What are you going to do now? Well, I'll go out to the place till the arm's all right. Oh, that'll be about another month. You better have me have a look at it again next week. Are you all through rodeoing? No. The doctor looked at him, speculating. I think you'd want to settle down. You could buy that place cheap, I imagine, for a little herd, put a little herd sheep out there, or a few cattle. But Tom was shaking his head. Look, the doctor said, I know you're a reservation boy, but you're smart, and you can make something of yourself. You saw what happened to Dylan and Old Mayo. Dylan was a tin-horned gambler who drank himself to death. Mayo Martinez was an illiterate Mexican just two steps away from El Facal, or Jacal. Uh, he still believed in Espiritu, but you've got a chance if you take it. He stopped wondering if he had said too much. Tom seemed to have retreated into himself. 
You talk to a Mexican that way and he smiles and nods and seems to agree, even though he goes out and does things the way he always has. But time after time he had seen an Indian just sort of draw the curtains and retreat, as though he was slipping back into the remote past into a kind of pride that was all mixed up with hurt and resentment. Tom Black was doing that right now, retreating into an emotional cave. When that happened, there wasn't a thing you could do. You could talk yourself blue in the face and get nowhere. The doctor shrugged. Well, it's your life. As George Herbert said, the wearer knows where the shoe rings. We've got to make it, we've got to get our own demons and our own necessities, I suppose. There may even be a pattern all laid out for us. Who knows? He got to his feet. Uh, come back and see me next week. Tom thanked him and he left. What the doctor had said made him remember the agent at the reservation. But he shrugged it off. It was of no consequence. He didn't want to think about those things. He went back to the cabin on the river, aired it out, and tried to settle in. But the cabin, for all its familiar corners, was a strange place. It was alien. For two days he sat in the sun, going inside only to cook his meals and sleep. And he looked at the garden, at the bean plants and the chilies being choked by the weeds. He was tempted to pull the weeds, as Maya would have done, but then he thought Maya was gone. His sweat and his footsteps were almost forgotten. If the beans and the chilies cannot live with the weeds, they don't belong here. I don't hate these weeds. I don't belong here either, now that mayo has gone. Instead of weeding the garden, he walked to keep his legs strong. He walked upstream, and five miles up the canyon, he saw four of Red's old rough string, the Bronx. They were wild as deer and snorted, tossed their heads, and ran at the sight of him. He walked a few more miles, then went back to the cabin. Neither then or in the next few days did he see the other Bronx or the second saddle horse. They had either wandered off and joined some other horse herd or mountain lion had come down the canyon and made a few meals of horse meat. It didn't matter any more then that the, than the garden mattered. They had been Red Dill's horses, and Red was gone. Two weeks passed before he remembered the doctor. It didn't seem important to go see him. His bones would heal. They were his bones, not the doctor's. He flexed his arm to keep the joints from stiffening. He took off the bandages and the splints and massaged the muscles, forced the circulation to help the healing. He began using the arm carefully. They walked out under the flats. He saw an occasional jackrabbit and a few pronghorns, and almost every day he saw a prairie falcon hunting ground squirrels. They found a small prairie dog town. He sat and watched the prairie dogs and the burrowing owls. He sat there not thinking, feeling the sun on his back and the strength of the earth beneath him. And vague cobweb memories came back, memories of Albert left hand. They drilled through his mind like shadows, and they were a dull ache that brought back memories of Benny Grayback and Blue Elk. He pushed the memories away and got to his feet and walked back towards the cabin. He was a stranger here. He had always been a stranger. All he had here was a hat full of memories. And what did those memories mean? Nothing. Less than nothing. They were like scars. You looked at them and remembered old hurts that had healed over. He went back to the cabin and it was a place full of strangeness. He knew every corner and yet he didn't belong here. He cooked his supper and ate. And he went outside and sat in the dusk. Bull bats peened overhead and dived on roaring wings. The first stars came out and the cool dampness crept in from the river. The afternoon's memories came back. They put them away again. And he looked at the corral, its poles now tumbling down, unused, neglected. He looked at the barn, empty and meaningless. Then he saw himself in the corral, learning to ride, to match and master the violence of the fighting, squealing Bronx, learning to punish the raking spurs of vicious rain and a brutal ride. He sat. And the late moon rose, and the sifting shadows and the thin moonlight seemed to set the rails in place again. And he saw now a deep set snubbing post and a bear cub chained to it. And the vague tree shadowed light, the barn became a barn where the boys who hated the smell of cows was forced to clean the stinking stalls, where a tormented boy was flogged for turning in his tormentors. He sat there for a long time. It was almost midnight. He shifted his legs and felt the cramps in them, and the ache was in his arm. He got to his feet, eased the cramps, and rubbed the ache. He went to his car, got in, and drove over to the foot of the bluff and left it there. He came back to the cabin and got an axe and a handful of matches and went out to the corral. He carried the fallen rails and piled them against the barn. He loosened the other rails with the axe and added them to the pile. Then he went to the barn, started at the far end, and set a series of fires in the litter of old hay, and went back and sat down in front of the cabin. The barn was tinder dry. Within 15 minutes, the flames were leaping through the roof. Then the roof fell in with a roar and a great billowing of embers. Some of the embers came all the way to the cabin and hissed and smoldered on the roof and died in the night dampness there. 
The grass, midsummer green and wet with river dew, steamed like fog in the blast of heat, and shriveled and charred in a great circle around the barn and halfway to the cabin. The big cottonwoods rustled, their leaves shaken by the wind of the fiery updraft, and those near the barn sizzled and spat and set up little spurts of flame all along their coarse uh, bark branches. When the flames began to die down, they slowly subsided to the great bed of coals that winked and hissed and spurted in sudden angry life. The darkness crept back, and now twice as dark as before, with the huge torch burning out. The valley was gray with acrid smoke, held close by the night's damp air, the smolder of old hay adding its sour stink to the wood smoke when it smelled charred green cottonwoods. At last Tom got to his feet and went inside and went to bed. It was mid-morning when he wakened. The cabin smelled of smoke and smoldering hay, and the ashes of the barn still fumed and sent up curls of white smoke. He cooked and ate breakfast, then packed his gear. He brought the car to the door, loaded it, and took it back and left it at the foot of the bluff. Then he returned to the cabin, split a big arm load of kindling, and piled it carefully in the middle of the floor. He moved the table and the benches over beside it and set fire to it, and went back to his car and sat down in the shade and waited. The windows began to glow with the flames inside. Then the smoke threaded out through the cracks and began to billow out the doorway. A window fell in and flames reached out and licked out the eaves. The flames burst through the roof and towered, hissing and crackling. When the roof fell in, a great shower of fine white ash carried high into the air by the blast of heat and drifting on the breath of a breeze felt like a fine snow around him and on the car, harmless white ashes, fine as dust. The windows began to glow with the flames inside. Then the smokes threaded out through the cracks and began to hollow out the doorway. A window fell in and flames reached out and licked at the eaves. I just read the same chapter twice. We'll continue the next paragraph. I make mistakes, too. It's, it's, mor it's morning. Bottom of page 145. We're back to it. The big cottonwoods beside the house withered and seemed to shrink and curl, and flames curled up their big limbs like hungry red tongues. The trees hissed and spat, then began to pop like gunfire. The weedy garden withered as though under a sudden frost of tall weeds crumpled and fell, and the whole garden disappeared, leaving only a patch of charred ground. The grass seemed to melt away in a spiraling circle that met the circle, scorched last night in the moonlight, and flaming embers fell there and blossomed briefly. The flowers that or the flowers that bloomed and faded in a few minutes. Then one wall tottered, sagged, fell with a fresh showering of embers with a new surge of flame. Tom waited almost an hour, watching the flames consume the cabin, log by log. Then the fire subsided into a great smoldering heap of ashes with the chimney thrusting up like a stubborn black thumb. He got to his feet, brushed the fine white ash from his clothes, and was aware for the first time of the deep, dull ache in his arm. He needed the muscles, accepting the pain almost gratefully. They got into his car, found the circuit schedule, saw he had missed four shows. He had been here two days over a month. The next show was at Wolf Point on the Missouri River on the northeast corner of Montana. He had four days to get there and to find a place to sleep and make his entry. He took one more look at the dying fire that had been the cabin, at the scatter of charred white ashes that had been the barn. They started the motor and drove away. So in that chapter 33, we see that uh, Tom's trying to destroy his past. And uh, he has no connection to that cabin. That cabin is somebody else's cabin. The garden was somebody else's garden. The barn is somebody else's barn. His only memories of those places are bad ones. So he's determined, since he's the last one to have this place, he's going to destroy it. And he's thinking by destroying that place, he'll destroy the memories. And that's kind of a theme that's going to carry on through the rest of the novel. If he destroys his past, or he destroys these, these things that represent the past, he thinks he'll destroy the past. Moving on to chapter 34. Before Tom's ride, the first girl in a wolf point, the announcer said, The next man out is just back in business after a month out with an assortment of broken bones. A bronc put him in the hospital. Could be he's out for revenge. Anyway, here comes out to shoot number two on High Tension, Tom Black. The crowd applauded as High Tension came lunging out. Three jumps, and Tom was dizzy with the streaking pain. Every jolt drove the pain deeper, but he fought it down with raking spurs. He made a hard driving ride all the way, then stumbled back to the chutes, needed ten minutes, and went back to his hotel room. The throbbing arm and the pains that racked his ribs kept him awake most of the night, but the next day he made the most punishing ride the Wolf Point crowd had ever seen. He spent another sleepless night and went to the arena for the finals, dizzy and bleary-eyed, queasy and stumbling with weariness. But he steeled himself, saddled his horse, grimly waited out the riders ahead of him, then he eased to the saddle, measured his rein and his spurs, and watched for the signal. The announcer bellowed, Well, folks, this is it. I said before the first go-round, this next man might be riding for revenge. 
I didn't tell you that the horse that put him in the hospital a month ago had to kill itself to do it, but it did. You've seen him make two all-out rides, and now he's set for the finals. He's still out for blood? My guess is now, I guess is yes. So now here he comes, that old devil killer himself out of shoot number four on Red Devil, Tom Black. The crowd roared, the chute gate swung open, and the big bay called Red Devil lunged out fighting. Tom was swaying in the saddle as they left the chute, but he summoned strength from somewhere as he rode Red Devil like a fiend. It was even more of a brutal ride than the one the day before. Tom demanded the worst the horse could give, and he got it and took it and demanded more. The horse was in a bawling frenzy and snorting bloody foam when the horn blew, and Tom was so spent he could scarcely pivot out of the saddle and out of the pickup man's horse. He stumbled and went to his knees twice on the way back to the chutes. The crowd was in a turmoil of applause. He sat for an hour and a half before the pains to ease that he could go to his hotel room. They fell into bed and stayed till the next afternoon, utterly exhausted. They went down and ate and went back and slept another twelve hours. On the second day, he got his car and took off for the next show in the circuit. He rode the next show and the next, and the physical pains eased off. But his riding style had changed since that month off. He was still the slick, skillful rider who could pile up the points when he wanted to, but now he wasn't riding for points. He was riding for the ride, for the punishment he could give a horse. He still wanted enough purse money to pay his expenses, but if it was a choice between a clean, high-scoring ride and a rule-defying ride that brought out the worst in a horse, he ignored the rules. The rule book forbade a rider to touch a horse or a saddle with his free hand, but if he drew a horse that reared a dance instead of bucking, he slapped it across the ears until it fought back. If he drew a quitter, he asked for a re-ride on the same horse. It came out of the chute, uh, raking and gouging in defiance of the rules, goading the horse to violent, malevolent action. He knew a dozen ways to drive a horse into a frenzy, and in show after show he let the points fall as they might and made the most racking, punishing rides anyone had ever seen on the circuit. He didn't win the championship that year. He didn't even come close. But he left no doubt that the glib announcer at Wolf Point was right. He rode for revenge but nobody is quite sure why. He was the devil killer, and nobody worried or wondered about who the real devil he was trying to kill. He finished the season in California, finished few, spent a few weeks waiting, restless and resentful of the inactivity, then was on his way to Odessa again. The next season passed, and the next one. Wherever there was big-time rodeo, Tom Black's name was known, Killer Tom Black. The crowds waited for his ride, waited for his name to be announced, applied wildly at the announcement, then sat in tense silence while he made his ride. They cheered some riders in the arena, and now and then they booed a rider, but they neither cheered nor booed Tom Black when he was fighting it out with a bronc there in the arena. He rode in silence, so tense, so profound, that those in the far bleachers could hear the grunt and wheeze the horse at every frantic lunge. Some even said they could hear Tom Black cursing the horse he rode, but that wasn't true. Tom Black rode in tight-lipped silence, even more quietly venomous in the saddle than he was on foot. And he was known as the hostile, silent man of the chutes on the street in the hotel lobbies. He had no friends. He wanted none and needed none. He lived for only one thing, the violence of his rides in the arena, and the crowd sensed it. They sat silent when he rode between, uh, because they were, they were awed and morbidly fascinated. Tom Black was more than a rider. He was kind of an elemental force a primitive scourge and a raw challenge that summoned diabolic violence for every horse he met and rode. Tom Black didn't always uh, master the horses, but that too was an element of the fascination. His losses were as viciously spectacular as the brutal winning rides. In Calgary one season, he was not only thrown but stomped by a horse and carried unconscious from the arena. A week later, he was riding again, stuck together with tape, cat gut and bandages, as the other riders said. In Denver two years later, a horse crashed an arena barrier with him and broke his right leg again, but he was back in action with a steel brace on his leg a month later. His worst accident was at Napa, where his horse lunged over pickup ants about just as the horn blew. In the melee of men and horses, one horse broke a leg and had to be destroyed, and Tom's left shoulder was smashed by a flailing hoof. The shoulder healed so stiff he couldn't trust the rein in his left hand, but even before it had healed, he was riding again an unorthodox right-handed rider. The combination of the force change in style and the wrenching pain in his left shoulder made him awkward and off-balance for almost two months. In anger at himself and to ease the pain, he began drinking. But the liquor slowed his reflexes as well as dulling the pain, and it made him more moody and truculent than ever. After half a dozen brawls in which the worst he got was a broken nose, he got into a Chicago saloon fight that sent him to the hospital with a concussion from a blow with a bottle. 
and a nice slash across his shoulders that required 37 stitches. After that, he recalled Red Dillon's advice of long ago, take it out on a horse where you've got a chance to win. He stopped drinking, became more of a recluse than ever, and rode with cold and ruthless fury. We'll go with one more chapter. I was going to go to 37. So we'll go to 35. Now, again, we're seeing over the years, Tom's become a rodeo legend, but kind of for all the wrong reasons. Instead of being for a magnificent rider, it's because he is so nasty, because he is so angry at, at, when he's uh, riding. Chapter 35, page 149. Nobody knew what drove Tom Black, but he became a living legend. When radio folk, when rodeo folk gathered to swap stories in hotel rooms, in hotel lobbies, or at the arena waiting for a program to start, the conversation always came around to saddle bronze, which had always been and always will be the heart of rodeo. So when they gathered and uh, talked about during Tom Black's spectacular years, somebody would mention Steamboat or Midnight. Somebody else would speak of other legendary Bronx, Iron Mountain, War Paint, Tipperary. As the names were mentioned, everyone, steer wrestlers, bull riders, calf ropers, even the acrobatic girls who were trick riders, paused to listen. Only the oldest of the old timers had ever seen any of these fabulous Bronx in action. But their names were as firmly embedded in the lore of the arena as are the centaurs and the minotaur in Greek mythology. They would talk of horses, they would mention the great riders, before more than three names were said, someone would say, well, for my money, Tom Black. And there'd be a pause. Men would lift their heads and look around. Tom Black was never there in person, since he avoided such gatherings. But his presence was, and his name was always spoken with respect that verged on awe. A first-year man, brushing his ignorance, might ask, well, what year did Tom Black win the championship? And one of the veterans would say quietly, but with rebuke in his voice, Tom Black never won the championship. He never went after it. And if the first-year man was brash enough to persist, well, why not if he's so good? The answer would be, old man Satan never had to win the title to prove how good he was. The comment was ambiguous and intended so and the references to Satan were inevitable. Tom was sometimes called Devil Tom with a kind of demonology. A satanic folklore of fantastic stories had grown up around him. One such story was that Tom Black and the Devil were first cousins, but that they had a quarrel and a fight, and the Devil chopped off Tom Black's tail. Tom Black was so enraged that the Devil, uh, had, to turn himself, had, the devil had to turn himself into a bronc to get away. And so as the story went, Tom Black became a bronc rider, tried to kill or maim every bronc he rode, just to be sure he got the right one, since nobody knew which bronc was the devil. Another story was that Tom Black and the devil once were partners, joint owners of hell. The devil wanted to place all to himself, and so he challenged Tom Black to a pitch game. But hell is the stake. Uh, Tom wasn't a pitch player, as everybody knew, but he learned fast. He matched the devil trick for trick, three days and three nights. Finally, the devil fell asleep, worn out, and Tom stacked the deck, but when the devil woke up with a final hand, he switched decks and dealt himself the winning hand. The devil won clear title to hell, but he told Tom he'd take him in as a partner again after he'd ridden 5,000 Bronx. Then to make the devil a joke of it, he said he would knock off 500 for every horse Tom Black rode to death. That, the story went, was why Tom Black rode the way he did. The story always led to speculation. Working a full season the way he did, Tom Black rode at least 150 Bronx a year, a full thousand every seven years. At that rate, it would take him 35 years, give or take a year or two, to ride 5,000. Take off uh, 500 for every Bronx that had died under him, and where'd you come out? The tallies didn't agree, but the veteran said Tom had killed at least five Bronx, six if you counted that one in Denver at the time Tom Black's shoulder was smashed. We'll call it six then. Take off 3,000 for the dead Bronx. That still leaves 2,000 he has to ride. 14 years of riding. Well, how long has Tom Black been up? I couldn't say. He was here when I came up six years ago. Hell, I saw him ride at Odessa eight years ago. He'd been around for a while even then. Well, all I can say is that Tom Black hasn't found the right Bronx yet. If you ask me, he'll outlast all of us. He can't. He's human, isn't he? Well, I've heard it argued both ways, son. But like I was saying, when you talk about great bronc riders, well, Tom Black's name belongs right up near the top. And that's the way the talk went. If anyone had asked Tom Black himself, he would have, he would have to stop and figure before, long, before he said how long he had been riding atop the big circuit. Even then, he might have been wrong by a year or two. Time 
no longer matter to him. That's a quiz question, by the way. Time no longer matters. Nothing mattered except those intervals to the arena where he, like the Brogs themselves, was a fighting creature, wholly devoted to punishment and violence. Between shows, he merely went through the motions of living, waiting, almost passive, driving from city to city, moving from hotel room to hotel room, going from one arena to another. Then those brief spaces where he came fully to life, when life had meaning. Nothing else mattered, because there was nothing else. Ride three times, pack and go. Ride three times, pack and go. Ride three times. It was a rhythm, almost like the rhythm of a pattern bucker. Sometimes the pattern might break, but meanwhile he rode with it as he rode the pattern buckers. Time had no meaning. Put it that way. Forget time. That's the way the years passed. All right, and we will pick up then with chapter 36 of When the Legends Die next time.